All right, so we're starting the uh, second session, and it will be an exciting session about storage and SSD reliability. And our first speaker is actually the OVD of the first of the best paper work, Ron Platka from IBM Research Zurich. And he will be talking about health bidding, uh, maximize the performance and the endurance of consumer level NAND devices. All yours. Thank you very much. I'm very proud to be here at the conference and to be able to present you our research work uh, we did in health binning. So health binning is, as I said, what can you actually do inside an SSD or in the flash controller to maximize performance and endurance of consumer level land flash. So first, I'm going to give a brief introduction about some characteristics we found in uh, this type of land flash memories. And based on these findings, we will show how the traditional wellending that has been used should actually be modified and enhanced. And this leads us to the new scheme, what we call health binning. I will go over the block management of health binning, how this is being performed. Then show our evaluation environments where we use simulators and hardware platforms. Before I then go further on and actually show some results in terms of endurance, what you can get with health binning. And finally, conclusion at the end, uh, you can also ask questions in the meantime, no problem. There is one big disclaimer I've put here at the bottom, which is I think is important that all the results and parameters I'm going to present, they do not apply to an actual product we have, even though we actually implemented it in a product and it's running in a product. So just the order of magnitude, how much benefit you can get is what you can take away from that. So. We need a large amount of characterization in research and in uh, systems. And we found quite some surprising uh, observations in land flash uh, memories. Now here, we are, in this graph, we're showing the uh, raw bit error rate as a function of the, how many times you actually write to it. And when we talk about the raw bit error rate, what is important is that we uh, look at the raw bit error rate as being the raw bit error rate of the worst page or even the worst code word uh, inside a block, and it's not the average uh, raw bit error rate of a block. That's very important because once you reach a certain limit and the error correction code cannot longer correct that page anymore, you have to go and retire that block. So if you look at, for example, block number one, block number one is a block, isn't really that healthy at the beginning, but if you see uh, the raw bit error rate at the end of life, uh, it actually lasts very long. And compared to block number two, which is, starts down here, it looks much healthier at the, uh, at the beginning, so it has a lower raw bit error rate, but actually only achieves, I would say, like half of the endurance than the other block. So the generally important message is the raw bit error rate at the beginning of life of a flash block doesn't tell you much about how it's going to evolve over time. So what you have to do is be more proactive in the way how you manage the flash. It's kind of similar with these cars, right? You might, if you go to Cuba, you might see these old, old timers still driving around after more than, I don't know, 70 years. Or if you have a sports car, you, you might have that for many, many years, but you're only driving it for uh, special occasions, right? Okay, it also depends on how you're actually driving it. That's a different story. <laughs> so, at the beginning, we started with doing some analysis, a uh, simulation run with a very skewed workload. So, it's a CPM9520 workload. That means 95% of the writes go to 20% of the other space. We use traditional uh, wear leveling, and we wanted to see how the program relay cycle count and the Robit error rate distributions evolve over time. Well, you can see that these schemes, they are very good in narrowing down the program relay cycle count because that's their main uh, target. But you also see that at some point in time, uh, the first lines, the horizontal lines are stuck down here, it's not really visible, but you see these horizontal lines and these are basically blocks that reach the error correction capability of the ECC, and you can no longer use those blocks anymore. So you have to retire them, and when you have retired too many blocks, you're basically no longer operational anymore. 
On the other hand, if you now look at the robot error rate distribution, it's a, there's a widespread <coughs> robot error rate. And I kind of point at an artificial point uh, with this vertical line here. That's kind of the end of life when you have retired a certain number of blocks. You see, you might actually find blocks which are even uh, order of magnitude, have an order of magnitude lower robot error rate than the, the other blocks. So you didn't really use your available endurance of the blocks efficiently. So that's kind of why when we started to rethink about what should we do in wear leveling uh, to achieve this uh, better wear leveling. Traditional wear leveling uses like dynamic wear leveling where your overrides and relocations uh, are used to balance the program A cycle count. So every block that's being garbage collection takes part of the wear leveling. What we think we had to change, uh, or we wanted to change is, we wanted to further introduce a better data placement. So try to group data which has similar update frequency together in the same blocks. And then when we do this segregation, we want to use better blocks for data that we think uh, is hotter. And the other way around also, we're going to use less good blocks for data that's uh, so supposed to be colder. Another aspect is static wear leveling. So typically, you always have like some data that is stored on the device. You just write it once, and it's never going to be overwritten uh, at all. And what traditional approaches do, they go and uh, search for this type of data. And, uh, from time to time, they uh, move it to another block just to get these blocks that were holding the static data, get them back into the game again that they can be used and uh, cycled. In our approach, we want to reduce the static wear leveling to the bare minimum. And the bare minimum, we define that by the characteristics of the NAND flash. So we want to address retention issues and redisturb limitations of the flash. So in other words, if from your retention perspective, you want to move your data every two months, that's going to add just six program relay cycles and in one year. And in 10 years, that's going to be 60 ray cycles. So actually, the static wear leveling part uh, is kind of negligible to uh, what you're doing in the dynamic wear leveling part. Also, traditional approaches use program relay cycle based wear leveling, so they equal out the program relay cycles. And here, that's kind of, I would say, the biggest change. We want to use the robot error rate of the worst page in uh, each of the blocks. So we have to go and build distribution of these robot error rates. And it also means we actually have to have access to the information that the ECCD code delivers us to tell us how many errors occurred when we read the page. That's the slide that gives like the overview of how we do block management in our approach. First, at the very beginning, all the blocks are in the free block pool. And the data placing the unit, it's going to take blocks out of the free block pool, depending uh, on for hot and cold data. It's going to take healthy and unhealthy blocks, uh, respectively. And uh, once uh, such a block is completely filled up, it's going to be placed into the occupied block pool here. While a block is in the occupied block pool, we have the chance by a background health check jo uh, job to go through all these blocks and find out what's the worst page robot error rate. And we build a distribution out of that. And based on the distribution, we are then going to go and create those blocks. So we say, like, X amount of blocks are being healthy, and another amount of blocks are being less healthy, and so on, until the unhealthy blocks. How do so, you check them? Sorry? Once they are written, how do you check their health? You read them? You read them page by read page in the background. So you, you, you will not see that in your normal operation that there are background reads going on. Yeah. But reading is the same exposure as writing. It gives you the same feeling whether this is a real bad block just by reading it. It's the same operation. Uh, well, writing, it just plays the data on it. Reading is when you are actually verify that you actually can retrieve the data and correct it. Right? And that gives you, by reading, the data goes through the decoder, and it, the decoder is going to tell you how many, how many errors have been corrected. And that's our input what we use. 
So what is further important is the garbage collector is going to pick up these blocks, and typically you want to pick up a block which has a lot of invalidated pages that have been overwritten over time. Uh, all our results I'm going to present are based on the physical uh, space. So we are not looking at the logical space because garbage collection typically uh, adds write amplification. And because this write amplification is different for different garbage collection schemes, we don't want to have any uh, dependency on that. Also, it depends on the amount of over provisioning you are using. So we are not really, we don't want to have these results depending on these. But we have to say that you have to take a reasonably good garbage collector to work well with health bin. Uh, now, if approach would be just uh, choosing all this, the oldest block in the system, so your health feeling wouldn't be that effective anymore. So, garbage collected blocks, the read occasions, right, kind of decrease the heat of the LBA, and uh, the blocks are being placed in the three block pools down here. So, it's a summary. What we need is the checking the health of the blocks in the background. We have to separate the different health grades in the free block queues, and we have to do uh, segregation in the data placement. <coughs> this slide shows you, uh, gives an overview of the simulation environment we use. So the, all the simulation environment implements this block management uh, I've just explained before. The only thing what you're not doing is, we are not really doing IOs in the sense the data is not being transferred. So we are not writing the data, we are not reading the data, and uh, because we still need to have um, input what would have been the amount of errors. We use uh, large-scale characterization results to build a flash model for each of the devices that we actually uh, analyze and hook that in into our simulator to give us this information. On the other hand, we have this real hardware platform that's shown here with the flash chips, the FPGA as a controller and general purpose <coughs> processor for running block management. So the hardware is, for us, we use that to develop the real product, but also to verify that our assumptions we make, uh, make in the simulations are actually correct. So the hardware implements the error correction code now, that uh, functionality. Unfortunately, we cannot really use the hardware to estimate it or to uh, evaluate the full endurance of the device, because it would have taken us many months just to run the one single uh, test, right? But in simulation, this is not short. And at the end of the test, you would have to throw away the chips and take new chips, of course. So here are some of the results I would like to present. Um, this is the state at the end of life, and I'm going to show you the cumulative density functions of the Robit error rates. So each of the curves is one simulation run, and it takes basically a different amount of writes overall. And the percentages that are shown here are basically by how much additional uh, writes you can do compared to the baseline where you have no wear leveling. So we used uh, just uniform random workloads uh, as one workload. And what you can see is the health binning doesn't really help you there. What really helps you in uniform random is the Robit error based uh, wear leveling, which gives about 10% additional endurance. Now, why is this the case? Because of this type of workload, the best choice you can make is to take always your healthiest block. Whereas health binning, when you relocate data, uh, this data gets colder, and the health binning wants to, uh, to place this colder data on less good blocks. So it's going to choose a less good block, and that's why it's not performing that well. But as soon as your workload has just a little bit of skew, so we have range here from 60, 20, up to 95, 20, then health binning quickly outperforms all other schemes and gives tremendous uh, improvements in endurance. Also uh, interesting to see is that the actual program is cycle-based wear leveling doesn't really give you much benefit over no wear leveling. So what happens now during the lifetime of uh, such a simulation run? That's going to be shown here on this slide. We have a Zipfin 9520 workload. We use like tens of thousands of blocks with different parameters. And we are using health binning with four streams. 
in segregation. And you can now clearly see, compared to the previous result I was showing at the beginning, that the program year cycle count distribution goes very wide and widens over, over time. Whereas on the other side, the robot error rate distribution is extremely narrow up to some point in time and stays narrow until the end of the life. So more or less, you're kind of consuming all your available program array cycles of the device. So that's a big achievement. Now, we wanted to also see further uh, how fast or how good can a health be adapt to these properties we have seen in the NAND flash chips. And for this, we modify the simulations in the sense that we just use 100 different block types. We still have tens of thousands of blocks that are being simulated, but they are just follow one of these 100 types. So now, on the program A cycle uh, count plot, you can identify these different um, uh, block types easily. And you can see that some blocks start with a very low slope and then suddenly start increasing the slope. So these are blocks that initially were looking quite unhealthy, but actually uh, over time you realize, oh, they're actually really good blocks and we should use them much more. On the other hand, you have other blocks up here, right? They were being used a lot at the beginning of the life, but it turned out later on that they're actually not so good blocks and that's why these curves are turning down afterwards. We also see that on the Robit error rate distribution, the distribution widens a bit compared to the previous results, but that's kind of clear because we are using uh, less blocks overall. So the next result, we wanted to look at uh, how many streams should you actually use when you do segregation. And when we talk about segregation, one important thing is that we use separate streams for data that's being relocated and data that comes from the host, because these type of uh, write workloads have different characteristics. And generally, what you can see is that using more streams always increases the endurance gains that you can get. But when your workload is very skewed, then there is almost no difference between the using two, four, or eight streams. So we are, we are already at a very good point here. Right? There are some uh, limitations about the number of streams. Typically, you have to reserve some DRAM memory for each block that is in the data placement unit. And the amount of DRAM you have available might actually limit the number of streams you can support in the system. Uh, a less technical or implementation specific uh, point is that all your blocks that are in the data placement unit on the long term average they are kind of just half filled all the time and because they are only half filled they kind of take away artificially uh, part of your over provisioning space so the more blocks you have in there the lower looks like your over provisioning you have so that means on the higher level, you will see higher write amplification due to that. And because we didn't analyze the higher level uh, performance, we only looked at the lower level, we don't see that in these results. So that kind of brings me already to the end and conclusion of this talk. We have seen that there are certain properties in NAND flash uh, memory devices that uh, are very important to take care of and that actually can be uh, done using health pinning. In health pinning, we use the robot error rate of the worst page to classify blocks into health grade. Uh, we do better data placement by segregating the writes into, uh, according to their update frequencies. So we track the uh, hotness of each error game in error game is a four kilobyte granularity. And we try to reduce the static bare leveling to the bare minimum what you really need. So that means to just address retention and read disturb limitations of the NAND flash. Uh, we have seen that health pinning can improve significantly uh, endurance in the devices. And one thing that is extremely important, I think, because your 
rapid error uh, rate distribution is now much narrower than in the other approach, you will less run into situations where you actually have uh, ECC decoder failure and you have to re read the data to try to actually be able to uh, correct that uh, data with a secondary. That ultimately leads to much more consistent latency over the whole device lifetime, which is, I think, a very important uh, key feature. But you can only do this if you can implement these changes directly inside the flash controller and you control the access to the flash. Yeah, that's something you cannot do on top of uh, existing SSDs. So for us, health pinning is a key enable for using consumer level NAND flash in enterprise storage systems. But I think it's not just limited to enterprise storage systems. It could be used in any type of control or even consumer grade controllers. We have integrated health pinning into one of our available products. And it's running now in the field for more than one year. So far, we haven't had any issue with it. So that's a really good news. Currently, our work is on looking on how we can further integrate and extend the health pinning algorithms to cope with 3D NAND flash. So, so far, we are only looking at final NAND flash. But we now got the first uh, characterization results that we can use some field models. And there are also new aspects that are important in 3D NAND flash that we have to take care of. So at this point, I would like also to thank all the other people in IBM that did actually all the characterization work in the Zurich lab and the teams in the US that helped us doing this and also the team in um, Houston who is doing the development of the, our flash system products and I'm free to answer any question you have related to this presentation. soon after programming do you measure it? Because when you write, unless you fail, there are no errors. Uh, that's not really true. I cannot say, it, I cannot tell more about it. But it can be that you actually see more errors at the beginning. Not beginning of the life of the chip. No, no, I just right after programming it might even be you see a much higher of the error. So there is some time that the block stays on the shelf before we actually go and evaluate it. And uh, you also have to say that the, the robot error rate is going to change with the time the, the data is stored on the block and hasn't been changed, right? So after a week or two weeks, the robot error rate is going to be different. No, but there are other ways you can control that. No, this I understand. That's retention, you lose charge. Yeah. But that, by the way, you can correct. You don't need to, to erase. Yeah. Add charge if you want. Yeah, once a page is programmed, you're not going to change the content of those pages anymore. Because the reason why you're not doing this is uh, in NAND flash, you have to program pages sequence, sequentially, one after the other. And the reason why you do that is when you do it sequentially, you're only going to influence by your programming the previously written data. So if you would actually go and put some additional charge into your cells, of any page, then you would influence all the neighboring cells of the neighboring pages. And that's one thing you don't want to do. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what's the, what's the read amplification impact of this scheme? How, how frequently do you read those uh, blocks back? That's a good question, which I'm not allowed to answer, unfortunately. <laughs> but, Let's say it this way, right? There are specifications that tell what is the retention guarantees the, the manufacturer give. Um, based on that, you can kind of estimate in an engineering approach what is a reasonable frequency. It also depends on how many rights you uh, kind of guarantee, uh, so how many full device rights per day you absorb in the device, right? Uh, that might actually accelerate or uh, make it slower how frequently you have to do that. Uh, Grading in the background. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it looks like uh, another question could go flying. Uh, I'm particularly seldom and we're not allowed to <laughs> so you know, probably says, you know, we will find room in there. There you will be able to answer that. Uh, okay, let's have the speaker again.